What's happening, friends? Welcome to another edition of Syracuse Basketball Post Game, presented by Kraus Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for SU Athletics. Brent Axe in Syracuse, New York. Mike Waters in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Got to be one of the more unique locales. Uh, Mike has covered a regular season basketball game at the very least, and he saw Syracuse beat Oregon today. 83 to 63 as you did we're going to hear from our syracuse sports insiders coming up here shortly and recap it all here but mike uh the story of this game and we're going to get your thoughts on being there in south dakota shortly but the bench bosses today to see quadir copeland to see the these guys come off the bench malik brown kyle cuff gives him a little juice there Syracuse could not have started this game any worse. They dug themselves a 14-4 to hole. Couldn't look like anybody could uh, put the ball in the hole uh, at, to start this thing. But the bench came in and gave this team just a, a real jolt. Uh, tell me about that lineup adjustment that Adrian Autry made and why it was so successful. Yeah, you're right. Like you said, the Syracuse comes out. They're struggling offensively. They're not hitting anything, uh, struggling to find good shots. I think they made one field goal in the first five, six minutes of the game. And then all of a sudden it's a lineup uh, that consisted of Judah Mintz and four reserves. And I mean, we've seen Malik Brown come into games early this year and, and, and quite your Copeland usually is another guy that Adrian will turn to early, but to see the lineup also include Kyle Cuff and Benny Williams. And it's that group that really turned things around and you know, Kyle Cuff it ends up with eight points today, but he gets them all in a key stretch in that first half, two, three pointers, you know, all of a sudden, Oregon's like, wait, wait, wait. You know, <laughs> this, guy was, guy? this guy was pretty deep in the scouting report, and, and all of a sudden we have to be concerned about him. Um, Benny Williams, you know, we all know it's well documented. He's had a really tough go of it early in the season, missing some games, being suspended for others. And to see him, though, come off the bench and just contribute the way he did. He didn't – it wasn't like he just came in and just made some shots. He, 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 he rebounded. He defended. He got some steals. He threw it great outlet pass uh, as Syracuse started to rev things up. And really, it was the effort that those guys made, especially, I thought, on the defensive end that gener that generated offense. You know, to see a team come in, and, you know, the reserves come in and, and give a spark like that. And to see the, the defense spark the team, the defense energizes the offense. You know, it, it was just, uh, I, you really do have to tip your hat to all those kids that came off the bench and it wasn't like it was your sixth and seventh men who get consistent minutes every game. It was a couple guys getting in there who, whose minutes has been you know, kind of inconsistent so far this year. And that can be a hard role to play. Uh, but Kyle Cuff and Benny Williams today, I thought did really, really well. Um, and were really the keys to this victory for Syracuse. couple thoughts there, Mike. I thought the most popular Kyle today would be Kyle McCord, the new Syracuse quarterback who transferred from Ohio State. But Kyle Cuff had something to say about that. <laughs> and so good for him to come off the bench. Like you said, he's deep on the scouting report. And we've seen moments and flashes from Kyle Cuff this year, but that's exactly what he can bring to the table. A good mix of shooting threes, but also breaking away had a really nice dunk. And I thought of us, and I thought of our post-game show watching Benny Williams in the first half because time and again, Mike, when we've talked about Benny, it's been well-documented, the ups and downs he's had this year. But what the, we kept coming back to was the thought that they're going to need Benny Williams. And that first half and what he did in that first half is a prime example of what Benny Williams can bring to the table. He was rebounding. He was playing good defense. He had a nice reverse jam in this game, a couple of great jams, including a reverse jam, the explosiveness at the hoop. When he's locked in like that, that's the Benny Williams need to see, and that's why Adrian Autry has done his very best to kind of wade through all these issues that Benny Williams uh, brings to the table because that's what he can bring to the table on the court when he's locked in. I totally agree with you, uh, and, and we didn't even see one big aspect of, of what this team can get from Benny that they really can't get from anybody else, and that's on the it, it defense, defending another team's athletic and tall power forward. It, you know, Oregon started out with a lineup that included Kwame Evans, their 6'10 freshman at the four, but for the most part today, they went small. Their big center got in foul trouble, so Evans moves to the five, and then they're small. So you didn't really need Benny's ability to do that, but at some point you will. You just know you will. There's going to be some ACC teams with a 6'8", 6'9", 6'10", 4 
and it's going to be a difficult matchup, you know, for either Justin Taylor or whoever else is out there and Benny's going to be needed. And so I've had, and you probably have too, a lot of fans texting you or emailing you demanding that Adrian Autry, you know, show Benny the door or tell yeah. Benny, why are we coddling? You know what? No, you, you, you don't understand what's going on behind the scenes and we don't either really, but just having been around the game for a lot is, Adrian Ochoa was working with a, a, a player through a difficult time, obviously. You don't just cut a kid loose. You know, you discipline him, and if he's showing the effort and, and doing the things the right way, he's going to get more time. But you don't just, like, kick somebody out of the fold. Certainly not a kid like Benny Williams, and, and nobody knows exactly what happened there. Listen, if it had been egregious enough that that kid deserved to get kicked off the team, he would have been. But he, but he wouldn't also, be there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, the thing you know, that the thing that's never that, cracked, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but the thing that's no. never cracked, in, in the sense that I've gotten, and I'm sure you have too, is like he has not lost his teammates. Like if there was oh, some no. sort of sense that his team didn't want him around, he wouldn't be around, right? That's it's obviously important to listen to your coaches and do what they have to do, but you've got to be in that locker room with those guys. And I have never gotten a sense from them that they don't want him around so that's uh, what we were talking about we were saying you need benny williams but we're saving the best for last year mike because quadier copeland i mean what a performance for this guy off the bench 15 points he has nine rebounds he has five assists and just donna wrote a great piece about quadier after syracuse's last game and i love the headline because it was you know call him whatever you want Quadier is just here to do his thing, right? Glue guy, whatever title you want to put on him. Today was another prime example of that. Just you put him in there and point him in any direction, and he's going to get there for you, and he's going to give you that lift and that spark. And I know we've talked about that a lot this year, about the energy he brings to the table and that element he brings to the locker room. Now we're seeing it on the court. Now we're seeing exactly what he's capable of on the court, how, how much of a matchup issue he can be, the hustle, the energy he brings. But, I mean, 15 points is your second-leading scorer out there tonight. You know, I, the, the element that Quadir Copeland brings to this team and the locker room is he is an outgoing, fun-loving, happy kid. And, you know, you, you need a guy like that, the guy that doesn't ever seem to have anything that can get him down. Uh, who can? Who's happy to fill a role and, and do it in the best way that he can? Uh, you know, the guys on this team like playing with him. I think they like being around him. I was talking with JJ Starling just outside outside the team's locker room today, and the subject had just turned to Quadir. And I was like, you know, what's your reaction when he makes one of those plays where it's like fake, fake wrap around pass? You know, like the one he had. And right then, Quadir steps out of the locker room, and there is a probably about two or three dozen fans in the tunnel waiting for players to come out. There's a lot of Syracuse fans here that don't get to see a lot of Syracuse games. So they're waiting. They, they want to see their, their, you know, these Syracuse players come out and try to get autographs. And, the, and, and as Quadier steps out, and then listen, we've already, you know, a lot of other players have already stepped out of the locker room. And as they stepped out, no big deal. Quadier steps out and these fans erupt, <laughs> which with a cheer. That's great. And JJ says, there's your reaction. He goes, that's your, that's, he goes, that's my reaction right there. That's your, there you go. And, you know, and he did it with a big smile on his face. It's like, you know, yeah, you know, they, they love it when Quadir can come in and help them win and do the things he does. And, you know, listen, we've talked about it. There's still, there's good Quadir and there's, there's still bad sure. Quadir. And we yeah. haven't seen bad Quadir in a no. while. He, I think he's learning, right? He's a kid who's only a sophomore and he's learning how to, play his game which has a little flash to it but now try to play that game and, and eliminate the mistakes and, and both at georgetown last week and here again today this mistakes have been minimized while all the rest of parts of his game continue to blossom my new favorite thing from quadir is he is putting the cherry on top of the sunday with some sort of great move or dunk or today was a spin move and drive to the basket for a dunk and and 
just to see that element of his game. He's just fun to watch. I'm just thinking of a combination of a, a lot of different players. You know, glue guy for Josh Pace, how people love Scoop Jardine and the way that he played, right? Put Mookie in. Like, all these things are just kind of morphing into one player here with Quadir. And, boy, what a performance from him today. And Syracuse needs it. They needed their bench to step up today, and, and he was really big in that department. The other Mike, thing that's great about Quadir yeah. – Real quick, Brent, sorry to interrupt you, but um, with quite here, if he can play that way and so he can be a threat offensively and he can help create stuff and everything, well, that that allows him to play more, and that's good because he is such a good defensive player. Yes. He can guard multiple positions. He really helps out the defense because if they have to switch, he's not at a real disadvantage no matter who he's on. He, he he's, he's a really good defensive player and, you know, among all the other keys, and we're really talking about guys here today, but the other big key to this game was how well they played defensively. And I don't think that's an accident that you play well defensively when Quadir Copeland's on the floor for 26 minutes. That's a great point. Mike, before we let you go, uh, what a unique environment, what a unique place to go. Uh, in your years covering Syracuse basketball, it's got to be one of the most unique regular season locations that you've gone to. Uh, if, if you didn't catch some of Mike's pregame uh, tweets and pictures, I would encourage you to check out his Twitter feed to see this unique spot you were in. So tell us what it was like to, to be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in the middle of December for a regular season basketball game. And remind people why exactly this game took place there. Well, you know, it's one of these one-off games that's put together by, you know, the folks here in, in Sioux Falls, uh, um, a health or a medical group is kind of like the big deal here in town and uh, Sanford health. And uh, so they want to bring these games in and fill up this arena and bring attention to the facility here. And of course, you know, there's both teams are going to get a guarantee, right? Uh, you know, we don't know exactly how much that is, but it's a good exposure game and teams like to play neutral court games at this point in the season, you know, they, most coaches don't want to play too many true road games. So you get a neutral court game against a quality opponent and you'll usually take it. This facility, obviously never been here before. I've never been to South Dakota before. I uh, heard a little bit about it, the Pentagon. It seats about 32, 3,500 people. It's only 10 years old, but when they built it, they did so with a mindset that they really wanted to give it an old time feel. They get a lot of retro features here. They've got an old, you know, scoreboard clock uh, above the court that has the dial the arrow that goes oh, that's around. that's cool yeah now that's not official that you know they use it during the game but of course they have the since it's only 10 years old they got the really nice digital video boards at either end of the court and you know so you get all the modern amenities of a 10 year old building i mean the locker rooms are you know they're for the g league team you know the the sky force uh, plays here Sioux Falls Sky Force. So their locker rooms are high quality locker rooms, you know, for an NBA slash G League type outfit. But, you know, you have exposed wood beams in the roof and the ceiling. You've got exposed brick down the walls. You got a parquet floor and the concourses to give it more of that retro look have all these old black and white in large photos of high school teams from South Dakota, college teams from the state. You know, if you want to go find like the 1963 South Dakota State champions and there's their team photo or you can go even further back. I was looking at one wall. It went back to 1908. Oh, wow. And, oh, great photos. I've, there's one. I saw a real photo that stood out to me. Like, you know, women's basketball in the upper Midwest was big um, back in the day. Uh, and there was a photo of women playing outdoors in skirts with bloomers and they're playing on a grass court. Huh. And and they have this old black and white photo, and I'm like, oh man, it just gave off this really cool, like Hoosiers slash Henkel Fieldhouse. That's what I'm thinking. Vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really did. But like I said, it's a ten year old building. They've got Sky Suites, uh, you know, all this other stuff around here. It's, uh, it's like I said, it's got all the modern features with the uh, old timey feel. And hey, if you ever find yourself in Sioux Falls, if there's an excuse to come see a game, take advantage of it. It'd be really neat. There were certainly some Syracuse fans there. We had some of our Syracuse sports insiders that were texting me from the game. They were asking, why is Judah Mintz wearing two different colored shoes? And I think that was just a fashion choice. Well, actually, uh, those sense. are Kyrie's. The, the, that's not Oh, like, okay. He, he didn't take two pairs of shoes and mix and match. Those are those are a pair of Kyrie's. Uh, so they're made that way. 
Uh, gotcha. But he wore them today because the one was red and the one was green, so it was Christmas. There you go. I Happy think that was your that Happy was your holidays. official guess on that. By the way, good job. Guess. Yes, he pulled those out because it is the holiday season. <laughs> uh, but those are a pair of Kyrie Irvings, and I got to admit, I didn't know that until talking to Jude after the game. Yeah, Don is the shoe expert, so we were yes. consulting her uh, yes. on that as well. Our, our new Hall of Famer. That's right. Congratulations to Donna DeToda, our new uh, U.S. Uh, Basketball Writers Association Hall of Famer. If yes. you see Donna at the Dome, address her as the Hall of Famer, ladies yes. and gentlemen. That she now fantastic. officially hates both me and Brent. For some <laughs> <laughs> from, from one Hall of Famer to another, that's you, Michael, also a Hall of Famer for the U.S. Uh, Writers Association for Basketball. Appreciate you checking in. Appreciate your hard work. Enjoy the rest of your time there in, in lovely Sioux Falls. And we will catch you again here on Syracuse Basketball Post Game soon, my friend. Sounds great, Brent. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Mike Waters, ladies and gentlemen, checking in from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. What a unique spot to play a regular season basketball game. And love hearing Mike's perspective on uh, the old-timey feel of that. I should break up my old-timey radio voice on that. And the ball's going up the court. And look at this. They're going to throw it in the peach basket here. They had the parquet floor. It kind of looked like the old Boston Garden. It was, it was unique. I think everybody was like, why the heck are they playing in South Dakota? But uh, we found out why, right? To our Syracuse Sports Insiders, we go, ladies and gentlemen. We would love for you to become a Syracuse Sports Insider by texting ORANGE to 315-847-3895. If you're a Syracuse Sports Insider, you get breaking news, including last night when I broke the story that uh, Kyle McCord was going to commit to Syracuse football. Our Syracuse Sports Insiders got that first. Your thoughts, your opinions, your questions. I was telling you, we had a couple of guys that were in Sioux Falls. They're texting me. They're, they're, they love the, we want Moni or Hema chance. Ask it about sneakers. Tell me the weather report there in Sioux Falls, what it was like there. So it's great to hear from our insiders that were there in Sioux Falls. You never know where they're going to be. And we're going to hear from them now here on the show. Texting me your thoughts throughout uh, this game today. And Brian gets on a great point here and says, Autry and staff deserve a lot of credit for getting these guys to buy in on defense. They have improved on that side of the ball significantly over the past several games. Brian, I could not have said it better myself. This team has improved drastically defensively. I think that was something we'd see improve as the season went along. But to be 11 games in, it's almost like they're making a two-game leap every game defensively, clamping down. What We saw some zone out there today, by the way, but certainly they're getting used to man-to-man. They like playing man-to-man. That bench lineup we saw with Judah today. Think of how Quadir played on defense, as Mike and I talked about. Kyle Cuff was great on defense. I can't say enough about Benny Williams. When he's locked in, And he's putting effort out there, and he's chasing things down, making a difference. It's the little things. I know Benny Williams can score. I know he can attack the rim. But to see him rebound, to see him defend, he had a few steals out there today, makes a huge difference. I mean, Malik Brown and what he does defensively, his presence around the basket, he had a season-high 13 points today as well. We have not mentioned Naheem McLeod. I mean, McLeod, let me pull up the stats to give him official recognition here. So he had eight rebounds today. Right? I know we're talking about defense right now, but he has a defensive presence in there. He didn't have any blocks today. But this team has looked a lot better defensively. They are bought in defensively, and that's the important thing. As the season starts to go along here, guys, we're only one game away. Niagara on Thursday, and then we're in ACC play. Like, we're here. And that was important today for Syracuse to beat Oregon, who came in with a net ranking of 51. So now you got a quality win in your back pocket. And if Syracuse beats Niagara at the Dome on Thursday, which I think they will beat the fighting Greg Paulus's, you're 9-2 and two in non-conference play. Given everything we know and knew coming in and how young they were, the adjustments that had to be made, adjustments to Autry's way of coaching, man-to-man defense, everything, to come out of that 9-2 and two, if they beat Niagara, which I think they will, you can't ask for anything better than that. You really cannot, and I think that uh, Brian made a great point there on that. Michael S. says, Copeland reminds me of Josh Pace. Brought that up a little earlier. He's not great at any facet of the game, but he's good at every facet of the game. There are some things you got to put up with with Quadir, right? But I think that's the perfect explanation of him. He's just good at everything. Today's an example of that. He scores. He rebounds. He has five assists. Brings some flair to the game. 
he's great at energizing his teammates and that positive approach that he brings, not only in the locker room, but on the court as well. Like, that kid always has a smile on the face. Like, you go up the quad ear and, like, punch him in the nose, and he'd probably smile at you. He's that kind of kid. Shout out to my guy Cody D in Charlotte saying red and brown are the new orange. How about Malik Brown? As we mentioned, 13 points today. McLeod starts the game. He's been losing a few more tips, frankly, than he should be. And then he kind of hands the baton off to Brown. McLeod had 15 uh, minutes today. Brown had 25 minutes today. 13 points. Two rebounds for Malik. Just looking at his stats here. Four steals on the day. We're talking about that defensive presence that he had out there. Red and Brown. It's the new orange. Uh, Ryan W. says, All things considered, great position to be in after starting so slow. Early game in a weird time zone may have added to that. This is starting to look like an NCAA tournament team. David K says, liking red substitu- uh, subbing and the substitutions. He's got a lot of tools and he uses them. And I like how players seem to respond to that subbing, adding, I love seeing Benny smiling on the bench. Let's play all our games in Sioux Falls. I don't know if we want to do that. I don't know if uh, Mike Waters and the great Dennis Nett, our staff photographer, and people want to spend all that time. Nothing against the people of, of lovely Sioux Falls. I think Sioux Falls and Syracuse probably have some similarities, right, climate-wise. But they were there tonight, and they took advantage of that that unique setting. I th- somebody brought it up in the comments we're going through here about you know weird time zone, weird place. They met in the middle of the country, and there was a, a video that they put out after Syracuse beat Georgetown. And Adrian Autry was saying, "You good teams went on the road, right? This was technically not a road game, but... You couldn't be in a more unique atmosphere than this, right? We're going, we're going to play a game in South Dakota. Why exactly? Because when Syracuse plays neutral site games, Maui, for example, Madison Square Garden, Barclays Center, like these are the kind of places you're talking about, like not randomly in South Dakota. That's something you had to handle. Unique travel, unique time zone. You're playing at noon on a Sunday. That's an odd time to be playing. Good teams went on the road, or in this case, neutral sites, and that's what a good team did today. Randy H. says, SU did a great job of winning with depth. Depth makes a difference. They have the chance to finish the non-conference 9-2. and two. Brought that point up a moment ago. That's realistically probably the best they could have done. Jack H. drops in to say, I said it last week, and I'll say it again. This team is nothing without Quadir Copeland. High praise there for Quadir. I don't know if they're nothing without Quadir, because I do think they're showing they have some bench guys that can carry the weight, can contribute, can push this thing forward when the starters are struggling. But if you want to use that phrase, glue guy, if you want to talk about through 11 games, and there's a lot of basketball to be played, who the MVP of this team would be, it's no question it's Judah Mintz. But Quadir's in that top two or three at this point, right? I think he can make that argument. Al drops in to say, Taylor going to see his minutes dwindle if Benny continues to play that aggressively. Just too talented, engaged on both ends, cheering his teammates. Yeah, it was a struggle out there for Justin Taylor. We haven't mentioned his name yet today. Yet he gets four rebounds out there on the day. Look, Justin played 18 minutes. He's going to split time with Benny. Taylor was carrying the load when Benny was going through his issues, when he was suspended, when he wasn't out there. We're starting to see that tie turn now. Benny ends up playing 18 minutes in this game, so they technically split. But Taylor just didn't have the offensive game you would want from him. But if he's going to be out there, knowing that Benny's knocking on his door, still gets four rebounds. Justin, even if he's struggling, what he's out there primarily to do, he'll find a way to contribute one way or the other, right? Al adding that uh, Syracuse could challenge for the top four in the ACC if McLeod was a more complete player. He just doesn't do the little things, and he keeps losing the opening tip and jeff from twitter regular contributor from our syracuse sports insiders i think wraps it up saying what a day for syracuse sports fans i have nothing more than that wow right all the football fans all fired up about uh, kyle mccord transferring in from ohio state big football news right just looking at some other comments here
from some of you guys out there, including Michael, who says the three guard combo, Mint Sterling Copeland gives us quickness, strong man on uh, man on ball defense and scoring. I like it and cuff with the string off the bench. Yeah, it's funny because the last game it was Monier Hema. This game it's Kyle Cuff. Like names you see get in to some non conference games, flow their way in. Syracuse has had a really tough schedule, so you haven't had that that run of, you know, for lack of a better term, the cupcakes that you get on the schedule sometimes. But this team is showing depth and showing that we're going to call on you. Like Moni or Hema in that Georgetown game was surprised he got called on, but it was the right matchup. Autry needed to mix things up. Judah and four bench guys. Kyle Cuff comes in and think about you're cold, haven't played for a while, unique circumstance. You're probably in the game when you didn't think you would be. What does he do? He shoots two threes and has a great breakaway dunk. Those eight points were key to Syracuse overcoming a 14-4 to hole that they dug themselves in and then didn't look back. Guys, in the second half of this game, Syracuse shot 73%. 73%! That's 19 of 26. This was also the second game in a row where the three-point shot wasn't that important for Syracuse. Now, Oregon went 4 of 27 from three-point range, and I think that's a credit to what we're talking about defensively and how much better Syracuse has been there, as as we've talked about a little bit here. But this was not a game where you needed threes because Syracuse was so dominant getting to the hole, so dominant getting the outscored uh, Oregon here. It is 50 to 28 in the paint. Now, look, it should be noted, Syracuse, um, what did I want to say there? Oh, Oregon. Only had seven scholarship players today. You got to factor that in. This team's had some injuries all year. They had a bunch of guys missing today. So take that for what it's worth. We're talking so much about uh, Syracuse and what they were uh, capable of in terms of their bench. Oregon didn't have a bench at all today. So for what it's worth, got to put that out there. But Syracuse will take it. They'll take the win on the road. They'll take the situation, the net ranking win at 51 quality play off the bench got like judah mint still led this team with 18 points by the way it's not like we're totally brushing him off right got to the free throw line again knows how to draw contact knows how to get those points but it's funny when judah's your leading uh, scorer at 18 points yet everything else is the story right the great story that mike told us judah the reaction from quadir when he came out and the fans went crazy he's like there you go that's what i'm talking about judah and quadir are our best friends they're roommates uh they're really close so nobody was happier to see quadir copeland have that type of game today than judah mints but look judah will come through and i'm just looking at the box score here so he was eight 18 points four steals today he did have six turnovers there was a combination of Let's see. Both teams had 19 turnovers. Syracuse got 23 points off those turnovers. Oregon got 18 points off of Syracuse's turnovers. So, look, this game was sloppy for a while. That first game was terrible. First game was awful to watch, and it it was ugly for a while. But as we mentioned, Syracuse locks it down. I think they went on a 29-11 to run to end the half. Then they shoot 73% in the second half. And for a while there, Judah Mintz was kind of – in the middle or at the back end scoring, but there it is. Eight of 11 at the free throw line, which is actually kind of a low number for a guy that can draw 16, 17, 18, upwards of 20 free throws a game. Yet Judah in a game where you're like, he was good, not great, still your leading scorer. I mean, that's the kind of talent he was. You know, we haven't even mentioned J.J. Starling either, guys. 14 points on the night. He had some smooth like butter drives to the hoop and two of three from three-point range. Think of a time a couple of games ago. It's not too long. We were talking on this post-game show about J.J. Starling really struggling from the three-point line. I think he's found something there. I think he knows what shots to take. He's much smarter about the three-point line. He gets it off quicker. He can have kind of a a unique follow-through on his three-point shots. But, you know, knock on wood, it has been much better for him because I think he's taking the smarter shots there. He's not forcing it. He takes it when it's there. But that is, look, this is going to change, right? This is going to change in that 
Syracuse is going to have to shoot threes at some point, right? It's still not a strength of this team. We're still kind of seeing, you know, Judican is much better at the three-point line. We're talking about J.J.'s improvement there. That's primarily what Justin Taylor is out there to do. He has his moments at the three-point line, right? Benny Williams can hit the three. There's a couple other guys that can hit. We saw Kyle Cuff hit a couple today, right? But you wouldn't call three-point shooting a strength of this team, right? I don't think you call it a strength of this team. But the last few games, they haven't needed to lean on it. And frankly, their defense has been good enough. Georgetown wasn't hitting threes. Oregon, four of 27. But there's going to be a team that will hit their threes, and Syracuse is going to have to keep pace with them. So that's something just to keep an eye on. But Syracuse has done what they've absolutely needed to do to win these games in the style of play. Georgetown was kind of a different game than this one. Oregon, the way that Autry has adjusted, put the lineup out there with the bench guys in Judah. He's starting to find his groove as a coach as well. So it's all starting to kind of flow here, guys, and I mentioned it. So a bit of a programming note. We will not have a postgame show after Niagara because that is also the night of the Boca Bowl. So we're going to focus our postgame efforts on the bowl game. I'm going to be on bowl game duty that night. I'm certainly going to watch the basketball game because we've got a a three-hour gap there. The basketball game, remember, that's a 5 o'clock tip time now. The uh, Boca Bowl will kick off at 8 o'clock that night. So we're going to focus on football that night. We're not going to have a postgame show. So the next time we have a postgame show, Syracuse plays Niagara Thursday, take a little bit of a holiday break, and then it's ACC time. They're in. Then they're in. Ready or not, here it comes. Pittsburgh, first ACC game at the Dome, December 30th. So they have made it through this non-conference schedule, maybe better than some people thought they would. People were uh, you know, looking at what happened in Maui, and that Maui Classic had a loaded field, and how would Syracuse recover from that? Looked at some boxes they had to check on the non-conference slate. For the most part, they've done it, guys. They can check that one last box against Niagara on Thursday night at the Dome. You're 9-2 in non-conference play. If I had told you on the first day of the season that Syracuse was going to go 9-2 and two in non-conference, I think every one of you, every one of you would have taken that, right? Every one of you would have taken that. And that's where they could be if they take down Niagara on Thursday. I think that's where we'll end things uh, here for this edition of Syracuse Basketball Postgame, ladies and gentlemen, as the Orange take down Oregon 83-63. Great stuff from you guys. Great stuff from our Syracuse Sports Insiders. It's right there. Would love for you to be a part of our Syracuse Sports Insiders. Just text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895. You get my opinions first. You get breaking news from me, as mentioned. Broke the Kyle McCord story last night. You guys got it first as Syracuse Sports Insiders. Great questions, great opinions, great story ideas, great feedback from you guys. So what the the Syracuse Sports Insider text line is, for those of you not familiar, I text you, you text me. So it's not a group text. You can text me directly. You can text as much as you'd like. I'll text you back. We have a good running dialogue back and forth. You just want my opinion on something. You just want a, a question answered on something. Hey. That's what Uncle Brent's here for. It's been great so far. It's a two-week free trial, by the way. Try it for a couple weeks. See how you like it. And stick around after that. It's just $3.99 per month. You can't cancel at any time. But we've been thankful to see that most people that sign up have stuck with us. And they love being insiders. And we love having you there. So give it a try. What a a great last uh, holiday gift to give out here with uh, the shopping days dwindling down until Christmas next week. Next time we will be with you on post game will be Thursday night after the Boca Bowl, but we're going to have a couple of great Syracuse sports podcasts coming up this week. Kyle McCord comes on board from Ohio State. We're going to talk to uh, a great writer from Cleveland.com, one of the best beat reporters on the scene that has covered Kyle McCord closely the past couple of years. So look for that this week. A couple other podcasts coming your way this week. So make sure you, you are subscribed in all the places on Spotify, Apple, Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube, so you get new episodes of Syracuse Sports as well. And thank you for that if you are subscribed and have been listening to the podcast all along. We greatly appreciate that. All right, tell you what, guys. Really appreciate you being around here. 
And as Michael has <laughs> says right here, he's exactly right. Not going to lie, guys. I mean, we went 35 minutes. That's a pretty good show for somebody who's been distracted because that's right. The bills are on right now. So you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We'll talk to you again on Syracuse Sports later this week. Thanks for being a Syracuse Sports Insider. And uh, we'll talk to you next time, guys. This has been Syracuse Basketball Postgame presented by Krause Health, the exclusive health care partner for SU Athletics.